Hi, my name is Brian Caffo, and this is Mathematical Biostatistics Boot Camp, Lecture 7 on Fish's Exact Test. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about Fisher's exact test. We're going to talk about the hypergeometric distribution, which plays a central role in Fisher's exact test. And we'll talk about some practical implementations. Uh, and then we'll talk about how you can execute uh, Fisher's exact test using Monte Carlo. Um, Fisher's exact test is a historically very famous test. And it's going to be one of the, you know, one of the first instances where we'll, we're able to ta test um, equality of, say, binomial proportions uh, using a, a formal uh, exact test rather than relying on asymptotics. So what does exact mean? So Fisher's exact test is exact because it guarantees the alpha rate. So when you do a asymptotic test and you use the nominal type 1 error rate, say, of 5%, if you, say, for example, calculate a 95% confidence interval for the risk difference and um, declare the difference in the proportions as, as, um, as being significant if, 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 it, um, if the confidence interval for the difference doesn't include zero, that's a, that's a nice valid testing procedure. However, that doesn't guarantee you a 5% error rate. It only guarantees you a 5% error rate in the limit as the sample sizes go to infinity. Fisher's exact test, in contrast, guarantees you the 5% limit provided the IID assumptions are met uh, for each of the two groups. And the, the background on Fisher's exact test is that um, the famous example is that of the so-called lady tasting tea. And in this case, Fisher was at a party and there was a wager about whether or not um, a lady at the party could determine whether the uh, cream had been put in place first or the milk had been put in place first into her, her tea. And Fisher devised a blinded experiment where he um, put tea in first for a couple of cups and put the milk in first for a couple of, of, of um, examples and then had her declare which she, which she thought was the case. So, you know, here's a kind of more um, um, uh, medically oriented version of that. So we, here we had a chemical toxicant with 10 mice and we treated um, uh, 10 of them with this toxicant and 10, I'm sorry, we treated five of them with the toxicant and five with the control. And then here we have the counts of in each group of tumors versus, uh, in each tr group of treated versus control, what number had tumors. So here, just looking at this, uh, four exposed to the toxicant received tumors, two controls received tumors out of five in both cases. So there's maybe some amount of indication that there's a difference that the toxicant may have some association with the tumors, but we'd like to test that formally. Um, and there's a lot of ways, you, there's actually a surprising number of ways you can wind up at Fisher's exact test. Um, and so we're going to go through a particular development. So the way we're going to develop Fisher's exact test is we're going to assume that we have two binomials and we want to test equality of the proportions. When Fisher originally developed this test, it was quite interesting. He, um, so, so in our case, we're going to fix this margin, the 5 and the 5. So we have 5 treated and 5 control, and we're going to model the probability that a, 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 a random mouse from this population of the treated mice has a tumor as being having probability binomial probability P1 and, and similarly P2 for the controls. Fisher thought about this problem differently. He said, um, I know that I ran, let's just assume this was the tea tasting experiment and he had randomized five cups to have the tea put in first and five cups to have the milk put in first. And he says, I know that these margins should be fixed. Then, then it would have made sense if the, given that the, the, the lady guessing would also know that this margin was fixed, she would have, it would have made sense for her to fix the second margin instead of six and four, she would force five and five. So he wanted to create a procedure that would force both margins, right? And it, and it turns out the Fisher's exact test constrains the margins, right? It looks at all tables matching the margins. Um, and uh, and it, that, that's, that gave him the motivation for designing the test this way. So he looked at so-called hypergeometric distribution 
which is, is a way in which we can characterize this table uh, in, in terms of having fixed margins. Now, when we actually implement the test now, we don't have to have five and five on both margins the way Fisher was thinking about it, but he was analyzing a particular experiment with, um, in a particular way, um, but it, it, the, the, the result of Fisher's exact test is constraining both of these margins and then looking at what tables um, satisfy the margins. And we'll go through the formal mathematical development of the way in which we're thinking about Fisher's exact test. There's other ways, and maybe I'll allude to some more of them um, later on. Um, okay. Okay, on this slide, so imagine that we want to test that P1 equals P2, where P1 is the probability that a mouse, uh, a treated mouse, um, had a, has a tumor and then P2 is the probability the control mouse has a tumor. And so they, we're going to want the null hypothesis that these are equal, which let's just call the common proportion P. Um, and, you know, just as a matter of practicality, we can't use a normal distribution or a chi-square test because the sample size is small. But also, we don't have a specific value of P, which um, is taken care of in the chi-squared and the, the um, z-test. They figure out a way to do that using the asymptotics, but we want to use small sample distribution, but making the small sample distribution, um, using a small sample distribution is hard because we don't actually know this, this probability P. Okay, so um, one way, um, what, uh, one way to think about Fisher's exact test, what it's testing, is imagine if we were to um, create the observed data or list out the observed data as the individual data points. So mouse one was treated and got a tumor. Mouse two was treated and got a tumor. Mouse three was treated and got a tumor. Mouse four was treated and got a tumor. Mouse five was treated and had no tumor. Mouse six was a control and got a tumor and so on. Okay. Um, now, um, one so so what we what I'm going to do right now is go through another way to kind of uh, develop Fisher's exact test, um, and it winds up with the same test. All these different developments yield the exact same test. Um, so in this case, imagine if the treatment and control were randomized, and we wanted to explicitly use the randomization process in analyzing the data. So treatment and control are, uh, were randomized. Treatment and control status were randomized. Well, then if the null hypothesis is true, then it should be exchangeable for any mouse, whether or not it got a tumor, as to whether or not it was from the treated group or the control group, right? The, the, there should be nothing outrageous about the particular collection of treated and control mice um, that we see how they line up with the tumor and non-tumor statuses that we saw. So what we could do is take this top row and permute the treat, treatment and control labels, right? Permute the T's and the C's. And we see the second row here is one example of a permutation, okay? And the result of that is is that the the total number of treated and the total number of controls remain fixed and the total number of tumors and the total number of non-tumors also remain fixed and that's exactly maintaining the margins of the of the table but this seems like kind of an, a reasonable null distribution to investigate right this that, that in other words that treatment and control status is exchangeable relative to tumor status so we'll look at some test statistic relative to this distribution and the consequence of this is every time we permute treatment and control labels, if we were to reform the little two by two table we had, it would have the same margins. It would have five and five on the row margins and six and four on the column margins. And this is exactly one way to develop the null distribution for Fisher's exact test. And this is an interesting way to develop it because it explicitly uses the idea of randomization. There's more than one way to think about it. We could think about this rather than explicitly using the randomization we could say, well, maybe treatment and control status weren't randomized. Maybe just the first five mouse mice got the treatment, the latter five mouse mice got the control. 
and we believe that there's no ordering effect, like there's no light that that in in the in the in the lab that only turned on for the first five mice causing tumors and and not for the controls. So um, in that case, we might think of not the relabeling as a process of 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 re-implementing the randomization scheme, but instead as a process of, well, we think if the null hypothesis is true, relative to tumor status, treatment and control status are a bunch of exchangeable, permutable labels, and that you could do the same procedure for coming up with a null distribution. And that's another way to think of it. Yet another way to think of it is the development that we're going to go through next, which is a mathematical treatment. But it is interesting that these very different methods of thinking about the problem result in the same test. And you see this very often in statistics where um, you wind up with procedurally the same approach, but that the interpretation differs quite a bit. I, I would argue that explicitly using the randomization, saying, well, this treatment and control was randomized, and so we're going to explicitly work that into our analysis, is a very fundamentally different process than what we're about to do, which is to, to assume that the data are binomially distributed, i.e impose a model, a, pop, a superpopulation model for the mice, and to work with that and, and, a st you know, and wind up with the same procedure. But the interpretation, I think, is vastly different. And I hope you think so, too, after taking this class. OK, so let's go through our more mathematical de development where we're assuming a model. Right. So now, before we were, when we were talking about it as a randomization process, we were kind of conditioning on the data. We said, "Oh, well, you have so many treated, you have so many control, you have so many tumors and so many non-tumors, and we're simply redoing the randomization process on the computer under the hypothesis that the randomization was irrelevant. Right? That whether you received the treatment or the control was irrelevant. And that's one way to think about Fisher's exact test. Now we're going to talk about a different way." So let's let x be the number of tumors for the treated and y be the number of tumors for the control. And our null hypothesis is going to be h naught p1 equal to p2 equal to the common proportion, where we're going to assume that x is binomial with whatever its sample size was and success probability p, and y is binomial with whatever its sample size was and binomial probability p under the null hypothesis. Under the alternative, they would have different probabilities. By the way, if, you, if this is true, right? If this is true, if both x and y are a bunch of IID Bernoulli sums, then x plus y is just the sum of more Bernoullis, n1 plus n2 Bernoullis, all with a common success probability p. And so it, it, it's an interesting and, and fairly obvious fact that if you add two binomials with a common probability, that the sum of the two binomials is also binomial with the total number of trials equal to n1 plus n2 and the same probability. And this is clear because if x is comprised as a sum of n1 Bernoullis with probability p and y is comprised as the sum of n2 Bernoullis with probability p, then x plus y is simply the sum of n1 plus n2 IID Bernoullis with probability p, hence its binomial n1 plus n2 and p. So now, the way we've characterized the problem now, we have two numbers, x and y, that are random. Every, in our two by two table, there are no other free numbers, right? If, if we know x and we know n1, then we know the number of uh, uh, non-tumors for the treated group. If we know y and we know n2, then we know the number of non-tumors for the control group. So in that two by two table, we know, both, we know the, the margin um, the, that, with that n1 and n2. And then if we know x and y, then we know the, the second, the, 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 which is the first column of, of numbers, then we know the second column of numbers. Um, so we only have two free numbers in our four numbers in our two by two table there. Um, so, but we still have one parameter that we don't know even under the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis says h naught p1 equal to p2 equal to p, okay? So what if we were to then con um, try and figure out a strategy to get rid of that parameter, find a distribution that doesn't depend on it? Um, and, and it turns out that the probability of one of the data points given the sum, and it doesn't matter, we just pick the first data point. You, could, you get the same procedure if you pick the second one. The probability of x given x plus y equals z, it turns out that this follows the hypergeometric probability mass function. And I give the hypergeometric probability mass function right there. Now, what's interesting about this 
is this hypergeometric mass function is exactly the probability distribution from our couple of slides earlier where we have so many um, bins of T's and N's and we have so many um, balls labeled T and C for treated and control and how if we randomly allocate treated and control balls to the bins that you know the, the first bin being able to hold six balls and the latter bin being the, the, the end bin being able to only hold four balls and I need to allocate ten balls five treated and five controls randomly to that process to the to those bins that's the hypergeometric the, the other way to think about it is this idea that it is the distribution of the two by two table where you're permuting the T's and the C's uh, uh, leaving the T's and the N's fixed in the way that we described earlier. Of course, that's identical to permuting the T's and the N's, leaving the T's and the C's fixed. Um, so again, it, it, you wind up, you wind up if you have the same data and you assume that the, the row margins are the margins with that include the randomized treatment, or if you assume the column margins are the margin that uh, uh, had the randomized treatment, you wind up with the same procedure provided you have this, the same, same data set. So that, that's interesting. Uh, perhaps comforting, perhaps discomforting. Um, but either way, um, now before, remember we only had two numbers. We had the two success probabilities, X and Y, or in this case it's a tumor, so I'd hardly call that successful, but let's say two success probabilities using the convention of calling a binomial event a success regardless of how successful it is. Um, we have the two success probabilities at the onset, when we know the value of the sum, then we only have one left. So in that whole margin, when we when we assume we only had two free, um, two free cells, given that the the row margins were fixed, now we only have one free cell, given that the row margins were fixed, and now that the sum is fixed. And so this is exactly what Fisher's exact exact test really tells you is that the, you know the, it, as you vary that upper left hand cell or any cell holding both margins fixed, um, um, you get the remaining three elements. You can obviously, you know, um, put in a value for the upper left-hand cell, and you can obviously go through the exercise of finding the other three cells very easily, given the margins. Um, but more than that, we also have this distribution on that cell, uh, the hypergeometry distribution that, can, that arises if we take the distribution of the upper left-hand cell and condition on the sum. Note that this distribution does not contain P. It got rid of it. And there's a mathematical reason for that. It's a so-called conditioning on a sufficient statistic. So when you condition on the sufficient statistics for P, you get rid of it. In this class, we won't go over that. We won't go over the mechanics of why we won't go over the mechanics of the logic of how Fisher came up to condition on X plus Y or what, how the mathematical de that mathematical development works. Uh, suffice it to say for the needs of this class that when you condition on the sum, you do get rid of that probability and there is a very general mathematical principle that is relying on that relies on the fact that X plus Y is sufficient for the, for the parameter P. Okay, so let's derive this conditional distribution. So we know the probability of X uh, it's just the binomial probability here. We know the probability y, and let's say z minus x. This will make the derivation a little bit easier, but we can plug in anything here, um, provided z minus x is an integer between uh, 0 and n2. Then it's this binomial probability right here. And then we said already that x plus y is binomial, so the probability that x plus y equals z is this probability right here. Okay. Now putting everything together, the probability x equals x and um, x plus y equals z over the probability x plus y equals z, that's exactly this conditional probability, just using our rules of conditional probabilities that we know quite well from mathematical biostatistics bootcamp one. And then if x equals x and x plus y equals z, then that's the same thing as saying x equals x and y equals z minus x, of course. And then x and y are independent so we can um, factor these two probabilities. And then, if, then on the previous slide, we had all three of these expressions plug in, and you'll find that you wind up with the hypergeometric distribution that we described before. Okay, so let's discuss it a little bit. 
Um, so in this case, we have more tumors under the treated and control, so we at least have an indication, but we'd like some sort of inference associated with that. So let's see if we can get a p-value. So, but we're going to want to calculate an exact p-value, and our exact p-value is going to use this conditional distribution. Um, the, the conditional distribution fixes both the row and the column totals, and we talked about when Fisher originally developed this test, he developed it wanting to fix the margins because he had assumed that the lady who was guessing would, would have known that he would have randomized equal numbers to, to T, T first and milk first, so he assumed that she would uh, have fixed those margins as well, so that went into why he thought that way. Um, and, you know, we talked about how this re yields the same test regardless of whether the rows or the columns are fixed. And that the hypergeometric distribution, which we derived as a conditional distribution, is identical to the permutation distribution that we discussed, randomly permuting treatment and control labels uh, if we were to string the data out as the full data set, not just as the 2x2 um, two two table. And so let's actually and, and so um, uh, all kind of versions of, all one-sided versions of Fisher's exact test yield the same inference. For two-sided, the, the way in which, this, you know, so we have the null distribution, but we need a test statistic. And it turns out that, you know, all test statistics uh, are not equal in two-sided tests, but I'm going to give you the easiest one, and, but it doesn't exactly match what, say, for example, R does, or exactly what was in Fisher's original version. Um, so. Uh, you know, I just want you to be aware of that. Okay, so let's consider our example from before, where now we're testing that um, the tumor probability for the treated mice is higher than the tumor probability for the control mice. So, so this would, the p-value would just require tables as or more extreme under the alternative than the one observed. Well, and recall we're fixing the margin totals, and the observed ta table was 4213. A more extreme table would be if not just four mice got tumors from the treated group, but if five did, right? So if we plug in five, then we know this cell has to be zero, this cell has to be one, and this cell has to be four because we're fixing the margins. And we can't find another more extreme table because if we were to say put a six in there, then that would have to be negative one. Uh, instead of zero, which can't happen. So, so there's only one table that's more extreme that honors the margins. Okay, so plugging into the um, hypergeometric distribution, we get 0.238 for the observed table and 0 0.024 for the um, uh, for the other table. And so the p-value, the probability, the conditional probability of uh, obtaining a table as or more extreme in favor of the alternative than was observed is 0.238 plus 0 0.024, which works out to be 0.262. So, as you can see, and you probably guessed, is in this data set, the only way we could have gotten a 5% significant test is with the most extreme table. And that's, you know, part of the consequence of, you know, exact testing of, of, of you know, these tests and it can be shown that these tests will guarantee the error rate, um, uh, uh, that, but, but, but only guarantee that the error rate is at most, say, 5%. Let's say you compare this p-value to 5%. Um, it does not guarantee that the error rate is exactly 5%. You can't do that because the data is discrete and there's only so many probabilities available to, to the p-value. Um, there was an effort at one point to introduce supplemental randomization um, to try and get truly exact p-values that not only honored the 5% level, but gave you exactly a 5% error rate. But no one is willing, very few people are willing to accept that as a solution um, where things not in your data uh, yield the, the um, have important consequences to the inference. So I think what you wind up having to do is if you want, if you demand, if the, the, your analysis de demands an exact small sample test, then you just have to deal with the fact that these small sample tests tend to be a little bit conservative. I would say there's also another, there's another strategy that comes up too. That's pretty good. What some people will do is they'll calculate the so-called mid-p value. So they'll only attach half weight to the observed table 
Um, and that p-value is somewhere in between, of course, the observed table and the, the, the strictly conservative p-value um, and, and other strategies. Um, but of course, it's, not, it's no longer exact. So I figure if you want an exact test, do an exact test. And in this data set, for example, the only way you could reject is if you got the most extreme table. Okay, so let me just show you briefly how to do this in R. Matrix C4123, comma 2. We'll just create the matrix, type it in, and you'll see. Type dat after you've assigned this matrix to it to double check. And there's a function in the stat package, I think, of R, which is comes with the base installation of R, uh, of fisher.test. And you just do fisher.test of a little 2 by 2 matrix. In this case, we say alternative is greater. Let's see, we get uh, uh, 0 0.2619, which is what we calculated when we did it directly. And it gives you all the information. It gives you an odds ratio um, estimate and a confidence interval, which in, the, in a subsequent lecture will show you exactly how, to how they calculate this confidence interval. Or at least we'll give the intuition behind it. It uses the so-called non-central hypergeometric distribution. Um, okay, so that's pretty easy to do. Okay, so the two-sided p-value uh, is a little bit hard. Um, there's other ways to do it, and R uses another way. And, um, well, I'll describe them. But right now I'm saying for the easy thing is calculate double the, the one-sided p-value, the smaller of the two one-sided p-values. You have to double, the, you know, it makes, I mean, it's easier to remember which p-value, which of the two one-sided p-values you double. You know, because if you double the larger of the two one-sided p-values, you wind up with a, a p-value bigger than one usually, or always, I think. And um, so, you, so you, you know you've done something wrong then. So, so the two-sided p-value, you double the smaller of the one-sided p-values. That mirrors exactly what we do in, in normal test and t-test and that sort of thing. So what Fisher did initially was he, so um, w w w the other strategy for creating a two-sided test is you need a two-sided test statistic, a test statistic that measures whether your, whether a table is as or more extreme than the observed table. So one example would you could, you could do the chi-squared, chi-squared statistic. So you could calculate the chi-squared statistic of your observed data and then calculate the the uh, hypergeometric probability for every two by two table satisfying the margins and then calculate add up the probabilities associated with those tables with the chi-squared statistic bigger i.e. more in favor of the alternative than the observed table that's one example um, And that's fine. That you could do that, right? So you could, given the information I've given you, you should be able to do that. Um, you should be able to do it with any statistic uh, that any statistic that measures the direction of the alternative. Of course. So, so you might say, well, how do how do you pick a statistic in this case? Um, since you can do any one, right? Because you can calculate the associated hypergeometric probabilities of every table. You can calculate the associated statistics, then summing up the probabilities for those tables with statistics uh, more extreme than the observed in favor of the alternative is easy. But what's conceptually hard is then picking the statistic. The problem being that there is no uniformly um, optimal statistic in this setting. There is no so-called uniformly most powerful Statistics. So there's a trade-off of power for when you do statistics and for, for which statistic you choose and its properties, um, which is too bad, but it is what it is. There's no solution. You can work out for a given data set what constitutes. Um, um, you, 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 can, you can work out basically every statistic for a given data set and convince yourself that there is no uniformly most powerful solution. There's merely trade-offs. I should talk a little bit about what Fisher did in this case. So Fisher's statistic was really interesting. Fisher's statistic was the hypergeometric probabilities themselves. Okay, so he, when he did the test, he would calculate the probability, the hypergeometric probability, um, were both the statistics and the probabilities. So he would add up, you know, he would calculate all tables that satisfied the margins 
and calculate every hypergeometric probability. And every table that had a hypergeometric probability smaller than the observed hypergeometric probability, he added all of those up plus the, plus the hypergeometric probability of the observed table, and that was his p-value. So what he's doing then is he's using the hypergeometric probability as the test statistic, because as we just talked about, you use anything as a test statistic, any function of the table is a test statistic, and certainly the hypergeometric probabilities are a function of the table. His logic went something like this. Um, if something came arose out of not the null distribution, but out of the alternative distribution, then those tables would be would have a low probability under the null distribution. So he used that logic to say, okay, well, the probability under the null distribution is a reasonable test statistic. And that was his logic. Fisher was a smart, Fisher was a smart guy. Okay, so p-values are, are, are usually large um, for small n is the second point. Um, uh, what do I mean by that? I wrote that. Oh, um, so, yeah, that's a poor way to put it, but but what I what I mean is um, the discreteness of the problem usually dictates that you wind up with a large p-value. For example, here we have the second most extreme table we could possibly obtain in our p-value is 26%. That's a consequence of A, the discreteness, and B, demanding a um, demanding a uh, uh, exact test. It is what it is. Um, so the Fisher's exact test doesn't dis distinguish between the rows and the columns. Transpose the table, you get the same p-value out. Uh, the common p under the null hypothesis is called a nuisance parameter. So the procedure that we're doing to get rid of it is, is um, called eliminating nuisance parameters. And um, conditioning on the total number of successes eliminates the nuisance parameters. And we're going to go through a couple more examples of this throughout the class of conditioning on a sum or something like that to get rid of a nuisance parameter. And then Fisher's exact test guarantees the type 1 error rate, but it doesn't guarantee it's obtained exactly. It only guarantees that it's obtained as a bound. And here is, there was another, there's a great fight that occurred in statistics. You might not think uh, statistics nerd fights are, are fun, but I do. And um, there was an extremely hard fought um, series of papers between Fisher and several other people about this procedure. And there's another procedure called an exact unconditional test. And this, the inventor of this, uh, Barnard, uh, who later I think came around to Fisher's way of thinking about things, said, well, why don't we calculate, say, for example, the probability of getting a proportion in, of, the, of tumors in the treated bigger than the proportion of tumors in the control. We can calculate that. It does depend on this, we can calculate that under the null hypothesis if we knew this common proportion, right? Then it's just a bunch of binomials. And sure, it, you know, maybe it's tedious, but we could do it. And he says, okay, well, you know, we have this probability for any given p, that's our p-value. Why not then just take the worst case variant version of p, right, the largest version of the p-value, and call it a day? It's super, super simple to describe. And that procedure, in some cases, has better power than Fisher's exact test. Um, it, it, you know, I think the math stat people find it conceptually maybe a little, um, a little. Uh, I think conceptually people tend to like Fisher's exact test, but I like the unconditional test too. It has a lot of logic to it. I think in terms of it's very simple, right? It's, very, it's a lot easier to, to describe. The idea of conditioning is very hard to describe. I would say, however, the um, the randomization idea and permutation idea of Fisher's exact test is very compelling. And, you know, so, so why don't we actually, at any rate, Barnard's test is interesting. You can read up about it. You can read about how they fought over it for decades. Uh, very fun literature. Um, you know, all the, you know, if you, if you go back to the biggest names of statistics from before the, phase, say, 50s or 60s, they all weighed in on this problem. And it was, it's, you know, and if you get far enough into the world of statistics, it's an incredibly fun literature to read. Okay, last slide. You know, I want to just ex ex expand on this idea of how you can, especially because we can generalize this idea to, to not just two by two tables. In, in the observed table, x equals four, and the observed treatment 
uh, was T, 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 five T's, and then five C's, and the observed tumors were like that. And you could do this little collection of two by two tables. And say, for example, in R, if you have the data coded in this way, you could do table, and it would just give you the observed data. Okay, so one thing you could do is you could permute the treatment labels, and that is exactly the hypergeometric distribution. So you could do a Monte Carlo version of calculating this hypergeometric p-value. Of course, we don't need to, but I'm introducing it because later on in the class we'll do it in cases where it's hard to calculate the p-value analytically. And you could, in this case, you, we simulated a table and we got x equals 3, and we just do this over and over and over again and calculate the proportion of tables for which the simulated tables have an x bigger than or equal to 4, i.e. have evidence as or more extreme in favor of the alternative. And this is just a Monte Carlo estimate of Fisher's exact p-value. This is exactly uh, a simulation process to, to give us this hypergeometric probability that we could calculate by hand. In the future, we're going to have harder problems where we'll need to do Monte Carlo to do it because there's no way to do it um, uh, by hand. And that's the end of the, today's lecture, and uh, um, next time we'll, we'll keep working on contingency tables.